So the Blue Zones, uh, the background of that was Dan Boitner, as I understand it. He was tasked with uh, uh, working for National Geographic. He was tasked with trying to find the places where people lived to be 100 or so. Uh, and every time he would find one on a map, he would circle it with a blue magic marker, and that became the Blue Zones. Uh, so catchy title. Um, but as I understand this, uh, there are several places, Sardinia, Okinawa, and one in the United States, and that's uh, uh, Loma Linda, where people frequently live to be 100, and you know, he's sort of compiled what it is that they do, and um, a lot of it are the principles that we know uh, make sense, that is, uh, having a predominantly, if, uh, and, uh, people will argue that are not exclusively, but predominantly plant-based diet, uh, walking, uh, working, not having obesity, not having uh, the diabetes that comes with the obesity, and um, having a good loving environment, a lot of family-oriented uh, uh, societies. And that combination seems to be very helpful for uh, uh, decreasing cardiac events. Now, people will thoughtfully challenge all of that because, uh, unbeknownst to many, uh, uh, the Hispanic race in the United States, or ethnicity, actually has now the longest life expectancy. Even though they have more diabetes, more central obesity, a lot of hypertension. And so, saying, and the diets are not good, um, and you, you're saying, well, what's the disconnect? Well, that really puts the emphasis on family life. That's one of the differences between our Hispanic eth uh, uh, ethnicity in the United States versus the other uh, the others there's a lot of focus on family and so that has a that in and of itself has a big benefit not to put the rest of it down I mean having a poor diet and a good family means a long life perhaps with a lot of illness that's not what we're aspiring to either so uh, African Americans with more risk factors and shorter lives, or Hispanics with more risk factors, more disease, and longer lives, still not what we're looking for. Uh, so we can do better with lifestyle. So we actually have pretty good data, uh, mostly from one of those blue zones, from Loma Linda, uh, Loma, Un Loma Linda University, and Gary Fraser, and the Adventist Health Studies one, Adventist Health Studies two. They really, and they've looked at the uh, Caucasian population, they've looked at the African American population, and there's some very consistent themes, and that is if you compare any reduction of animal products with the standard American diet, okay, you will see a progressive decline in the frequency of diabetes, hypertension, and obesity, and ultimately that'll decrease mortality. Now, obviously, it's going to take them a longer time and accumulation of more deaths, okay, to actually be able to characterize um, that more fully. But right now, it's very clear that men have about a 20% decrease in uh, cardiovascular events and death if they are doing more of a plant-based diet. Uh, so, but they actually are able to characterize their, their data uh, into uh, really five categories. Uh, uh, the regular American diet, those who back off of uh, animal products to some degree, those who back, back off of most animal products but maintain the fish, so-called pesco-vegetarian, kind of like the Mediterranean diet. Those who are uh, ovo-lacto or lacto-ovo-vegetarians and those who are totally vegans. And um, you don't see a lot of difference between the ovo-lacto-vegetarians and the pesco-vegetarians. Those differences are, are smaller, but the others, these are huge differences. And if you wanted to get 75% of the countries, if you were to extrapolate their data, get 75% of this country's uh, hypertension to go away, you would make everybody a vegan. The important aspect of refinement versus um, whole is, uh, is revolves around two issues that gives a third. How much fiber are, are you going to get is number one. And number two is how much carbohydrate uh, that's going to be balanced by the fiber are you going to get. And the result, the third component, is your insulin response. And so if you take uh, wheat and grind it up really fine and uh, remove a lot of the fiber and you know turn it into you know this soft white bread that used to be so popular in this country 
it's basically treated by the body like sugar and it does not uh, help your GI tract, it doesn't, uh, uh, that insulin increase um, adds to your, uh, your tendency towards the development of diabetes, central obesity growth, all of the negative things that you, that you would see. So the difference between whole grains and refined grains is, is really critical for people to understand and uh, all of the processed sugar, um, the, um, it, really want to decrease uh, the consumption of that, keep it to a minimum. Systemic hypertension is a, actually a variety of illnesses, um, but for the most part, it's a, an entire construct of our societies and, and our existence. Uh, we have hormones that are supposed to uh, give us strength and energy and control, um, you know, salt excretion, and, and these, uh, these hormones can get out of balance, and occasionally uh, you'll have a tumor that's secreting one of them, yeah, and they will drive up the blood pressure and make it uncontrollable. But for the most part, we have what's called essential hypertension. And it's such a funny name because it's the most non-essential disease ever um, to, get, to have uh, such a, uh, an acronym. Um, so by non-essential, it really is behavioral. If folks would decrease the amount of sodium intake, exercise on a regular basis, maintain a, if I had to pick, you know, we talk about ideal body weight, but it's ideal body weight with less central obesity, a flat belly. If people were to do this, um, and pr use predominantly plant-based nutrition where the plants have uh, the kind of protein, the kind of amino acids within the protein that lower blood pressure, particularly glutamic acid according to Jeremiah Stamler's uh, Intermap study. We sh could lower uh, or eliminate hypertension in, in most people. You know, people with the secondary causes, kidney disease, uh, you know, a, a, a adrenaline secreting tumors, aldosterone secreting tumors, those will be there and we'll figure them out and we'll you know, do the operations or whatever is necessary to, to fix those. But essential hypertension is really not essential. We've known for a long time that the uh, idea of soul food was not a good one. But we were focusing mainly on the salt content. And then we've got an idea that, yeah, if you really fry that chicken, uh, you're going to increase the fat content, saturated fat content, okay. So then it became, well, there are a lot of animals in, the, in this, and it is you take a piece of an animal and you put it in the collard greens or the mustard greens. It has to have fat back or neck bones or something like that. And then it became the fact that there's sugar. You know, for so many, uh, for so many of us vegan, vegetarian people, you know, it's kind of like, well, if it doesn't have a face and it doesn't have a mother, it's okay. Not true. Sugar is deadly. And all of the data that we've collected so far that where people look at it carefully say that eating an animal product is, well, is bad for you, but eating sugar is a little worse. And so if you put all that together in one diet, that would be a characteristic of the African-American diet. It was characterized pretty well recently in a publication uh, by the REGARDS trial. They, they weren't interested initially in just cardiovascular disease, they were actually interested in stroke. And they were interested, the REGARDS actually stands for the regional differences in, in, uh, in, stro in stroke based on uh, geography and ethnicity. And what they found is that that southern eating pattern, which is a lot of organ meats, a lot of fried foods, uh, not just yams, but candy yams, uh, have you know, a lot of sugar, sweet tea, that actually increases heart disease, mortality, particularly in the kidney disease population, and stroke. And so, and this is something that's imminently fixable. Uh, it, it means that you have to go into uh, the areas where our, our African American um, uh, culture is predominant and really talk about these issues. And there, there really are some exciting things happening in the African American community with uh, leaders who are really talking about this. and. Uh, there's one so-called sold vegetarian restaurant in the south side of Chicago is a good example of how you could take that culture and morph it 
so that there's less of the fat and less of the animal products and, and let's do better with this. Cholesterol really has, uh, if we're talking about LDL cholesterol, it really does have a pretty much linear correlation with heart attack, stroke, and death. The higher it is, the higher they, you know, the, the more you're going to have. And so if we talk about any method that lowers it, uh, with a, a, a few exceptions, you're going to improve outcomes. The exceptions are, uh, for one, niacin, uh, which uh, was pretty good at raising the good cholesterol, have a small decrease in the bad cholesterol, and the outcomes did not match it. And there are a couple other drugs that are like that, uh, where um, you, could, uh, you could talk about uh, imp improving plaque morphology or something like that, but uh, not having the mortality uh, improvement to go along with it. Or there's one set of drugs that, you know, the fibric acid derivatives where one of the studies said that, yeah, it decreases cardiac events, but the overall death rate doesn't change. You know, having someone die and bragging that they didn't die of heart disease is not what we're looking for. And so uh, we need to be very careful about how we lower cholesterol. And so far, uh, the data is pretty clear that if you lower it with statins, uh, and hopefully uh, at the next Heart Association or American College of Cardiology meeting, we'll find out more about the new PCSK9 inhibitors and their effect on mortality. Um, but plant-based nutrition, uh, diet, exercise, weight loss, those correlate with improved outcomes. Heart attack, stroke, and death are imminently reducible if we can, uh, and they do correlate with the LDL cholesterol. Now people will point out that it's not just cholesterol. Inflammation uh, is also a, a, plays a part in it, and it just so happens that diet and exercise, uh, particularly plant-based diet, lowers inflammation as well. So sugar uh, is a particularly difficult uh, issue in the United States. It's, there's added sugar in so many things, um, and one of the uh, more difficult for our population uh, forms of sugar is actually high fructose corn syrup. And the issue that we'd like to fix, if I could just flip a switch, it would be government subsidies for production of uh, high fructose corn syrup. It turns out that there are products out there you know, that are snack foods that are made so inexpensive for people to buy. And that's because of the subsidies on the ingredients. And these ingredients are not helping. And so the government is actually uh, historically paying into uh, production of things that they're going to have to pay for on the other end in terms of the cardiovascular mortality uh, and, and morbidity, excuse me. Mortality is pretty cheap. If you pay your premium and then you die, you, you're actually helping their system. But if you stay alive, and cardiology is really good at keeping people alive, it becomes very expensive. So um, what we'd like to see is that those uh, very uh, inexpensive treats, uh, people put them in the proper perspective and understand that if you're doing more than about eight to 10% of your ingested calories from sugar, that it's going to increase your death rate. And so our obesity epidemic revolves around it. There's a lot of sugar addiction uh, that needs to be broken. It's just a matter of uh, having people, first of all, withdraw make sure they're eating at, lar at, uh, at good intervals, eating whole, more whole food, plant-based diet without the processed and refined stuff. And they will not have, be dependent on the increase in the dopamine in their brain and the increase in the insulin in their bloodstream to make them feel good. And this is a transition that's not the easiest thing, not saying that it's trivial, but it's gonna have to happen because the health of the population is dependent on it. So we were shocked a little bit uh, to find that uh, the publication, I think it's almost a year, year and a half ago now, that, uh, that made us realize that diabetes was being driven by uh, the beverage industry. Uh, I'm sure they weren't thrilled to hear this either. And, uh, and so much of the news articles, it's interesting, so much of the press talked about sugar-sweetened beverages because we had been talking about sugar-sweetened beverages, we meaning uh, cardiology, the American Medical Association. Uh, we were actually in favor of the research that looked into uh, restricting sugar-sweetened beverages 
and um, you know, taxing them. And I know those, that's a very controversial thing in Chicago. Uh, and the Cook County Board was really looking for that revenue um, from the uh, sugar sweetened beverage tax that, that was passed. Uh, but then it was repealed and they sort of have a budget that they can't fill now because the, that money is not there. Uh, and they have to pay uh, for the health care of people in Cook County without that and the health care costs are going to go up because of the sugar sweetened beverages uh, and they don't have the revenue anymore. So you can argue both sides of that I'm sure, uh, but uh, the, f the, uh, the research does show that you're able to change folks' uh, choices and decrease the consumption of these if you, if you tax them. Now, we kept focusing on this whole idea of sugar sweetened beverages because it was uh, uh, producing diabetes. If you just have one a day, it increases your diabetes by 20%. But the one thing that the press was missing is that the article that talked about this didn't say sugar sweetened beverages. It said sweetened beverages. And most people have missed the fact that artificial sweeteners do the same thing. So I have had to go looking for every single one of them uh, to find out what is happening. If it's not sugar, why is it causing diabetes? And it turns out that a lot of the, uh, they're all a little different, but the artificial sweeteners tend to increase carbohydrate absorption. And so that thing that we had been hearing for years, that yeah, people who drink the, the diet sodas actually eat more of other things. And so that's why their weight isn't going down. Well, the increased calorie, particularly carbohydrate consumption, drives insulin levels up. It, you end up in the exact same place uh, that you did with sugar. And so it's something that every, people, everyone needs to be very careful about. Um, I'm actually, you know, even uh, there's so many people who are thinking about health and they're doing a lot of juicing. Well, if I could get across one principle, it would be the importance of the connection of sugar, natural sugar, such as in fruit, and the fiber that came with it. And don't separate them. And if you're, well, if you're gonna separate them, then dump the juice and, and eat the pulp.